but you know that from this day forward, the risks of not doing so are far greater. Because here's what I know. One, I know you have strengths. Whatever you think about in terms of your strengths and weaknesses, there are certain activities that make you feel strong. You have strengths. Two, I know that no one's got quite the same configuration, quite the same pattern of strengths and weaknesses as you do. The least interesting thing about you is your race, your sex, your age, your nationality. All the really interesting, unique things about you are beneath the surface, and no one's got quite the same strengths and weaknesses as you. Third, I believe that you'll be your most creative, most effective, most productive, most resilient when you figure out how to play to your strengths most of the time. And last, I believe that everyone will win when you do. You'll win, your company will win, your friends will win, your family will win, the world will win, everyone will win when you do. That's what I believe. But it doesn't matter what I believe. In the end, it matters only what you believe. So let tomorrow be a different day than today was. Let tomorrow be a stronger day than today was. By which I simply mean let tomorrow begin with you looking in the mirror and saying to yourself, what are my strengths and how can I contribute them today? And then let every day after that start the same way. Because you've always known what your strengths are. You've always known what was inside of you. So trust them, be proud of them, and go out and make your mark. How do you talk to your manager about your weaknesses? I mean, in most working places that I've been into, you're not supposed to have any weaknesses. By the time you get to any level of responsibility at all, you're supposed to be well nigh perfect. I mean, imagine walking into your manager's office and going, I don't have a strategic bone in my body. No, just strategy, surgically removed at birth for me. I can ask lots of what if questions, I just don't have any answers. Or how about walking in and going, no, I'm, I'm just, uh, just not a visionary. Can't see anything beyond around what's the next corner. Sorry, functionally blind beyond that area. I mean, who says that? Who says that? It sounds like you're like a, a First World War soldier going up to your captain and saying, I'm not really a go up over the trench kind of a soldier. I'm more of a stay at home, clean up the trench. You guys go up over the trench, I'll come back, it'll be spotless. I mean, come on, who says that these days? And yet... And yet you've got to have the conversations. You've got to be able to talk to your manager about what weakens you. If for no other reason, then he or she's got to figure out how to cast you in the right roles. You've got to, if you're going to manage around your weaknesses, you've got to talk to someone about it. You've got to talk to your manager about it. How do you do that? Well, here are two suggestions. First, don't say, this is a weakness of mine. Say, this is where my productivity is going to be lowest. In this area here, with this activity here, you're going to see less persistence from me, less creativity from me, less resilience from me. I'm not saying that to whinge, I'm just saying that to tell you. Second, have a couple of things that you think that you can do about it. If you're weakened by long meetings, say, and I figured out, here's a really nifty way to shorten this meeting up, what do you think? If you're weakened by doing the PowerPoint presentations and you just, you're drained by it, have a, sol a solution or a suggestion as to who might come in and do that with you or something, some action that can be taken so that you don't come across as someone walking in and whining all over your manager as though he or she should jump to it and try and make your world perfect. Your manager's job 
isn't to make your world perfect. Your manager's job is to drive performance with you. But to do that, they will need to have you take the responsibility for coming in and saying, hey, in these activities over here, these are where I am least productive, least effective, least creative. So, so long as you can phrase it that way and so long as you can come up with a couple of things you think you can do right now to mitigate it, that's going to be a much more productive conversation. Try it. There was a great Broadway musical a couple of years ago called I Love You, You're Perfect, Now Change which is pretty funny on the Broadway stage, but it's often something that we feel about our colleagues or our employees or our spouse or our family members for that matter. I love you, you're perfect, now change. And it raises the question, how much of a person can you change after you've hired them? How much of a person can you change when you're working with them? Which parts of you are changeable over the course of your life and which parts aren't? That's knowable. There's an answer to that question. The answer is that we can change your skills and your knowledge, but we can't change your talents. We can't change your enduring patterns of thought, feeling, or behavior. As an example, I can teach you the skill. A skill is a how-to. I can teach you the skill of how to present your product to a potential customer. Let's say you're a salesperson. I can teach you how to do that. I can teach you how to stock a shelf. I can teach you how to give an injection. I can teach you how to lay out a letter. I can teach you how to lay out a presentation. I can teach you all those how-to skills. The other thing we can change about you is your knowledge. I can change what you know about the competitive landscape out there. I can teach you what you know about the product that you're presenting or that you represent. I can teach you what you know from experience. So over time, your experience can change. I can teach you what you know about yourself. I can change your self-awareness. And I can change your values, which are part of knowledge. It's part of what you think to be important, what you know to be valuable in life. Clearly, over the course of your life, your values change. Your values at 15, what you think is totally important at 15, is not the same as what you think is totally important as 85. So I can change your values, skills and knowledge. Those can change. Your talents, your enduring patterns of thought, feeling and behavior, those are enduring by very definition. So if you're competitive, if you're one of those people that instinctively compares what you're doing against somebody else that, that loves pitting yourself against a peer on a level playing field and winning, you just get jazzed by that. I can't bleed that out of you. I can't berate that out of you. I can't make you ever believe that losing means nothing. I can't make you ever believe that it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. You'll never believe that if you're a competitor. If you're empathetic, if you're deeply empathetic and you feel the emotions of those around you, I can't change that in you. Flip that around. If you're not very empathetic at all, if you're one of those people who could be someone's best friend and never know it, then I can I can help you get a little better. I can, I can teach you that, that empathy exists. I can teach you that other people have emotions that aren't yours. And I can teach you two or three skills that you might need to learn to be a better listener. I, I can teach you all that. But the only thing I'm gonna do there is help you go from having no empathy to having some sort of karaoke version of empathy. I can help you get a little better. But in terms of those deep recurring patterns of who you are, how empathetic you are, how focused you are, how competitive you are, how strong your need for achievement is, how, how driving your craving for significance is, how altruistic you are, I can't change those about you. Those are recognizable to you and your friends in the schoolyard and they'll be recognizable by your grandkids when you're 85 years old. Those are the enduring parts of who you are. You need to trust them, own them, honor them, and then figure out a way to combine them with skills and knowledge, and so make a real impact in the world. People often
often ask, where do passions fit into strengths? How does passion fit into focusing on your strengths in life? Well, passions are the building blocks. Passions are the building blocks of your strengths. But passions by themselves are relatively meaningless. If you're going to take your passions and actually put them to use, you've got to combine them with something specific. In fact, I would say that a strength is a precise passion. Strengths are passions plus precision. Think about it. Some people have a passion for helping others. They're just naturally altruistic. But a passion like that, oh, I just want to help the world, is as vaporless as skywriting. It looks good up there, but it just, it just blows away in the wind. If you're going to take your passion for helping people and actually put it to work, there's got to be some specificity that you bring to the table. You could take your passion for helping others and turn it into the discipline and the specific activities of being an ER nurse and working in the frenzied triage environment of a trauma unit. Or you could take your passion for helping others and turn it into the much different set of activities involved in being a grief counselor in a hospice. The activities that fill a week of a grief counselor in a hospice couldn't be any more different than the activities that fill the week of a trauma nurse. And yet both of them are under the passion of helping others. So if you really want to take responsibility for your passions, yeah, listen to them. Yeah, write them up in the sky there. But then over the course of your life, it's your responsibility to bring them down to earth and put some spe specificity, some specific actions, some specific activities to those passions of yours. Early on in life, I discovered that I had a passion for asking questions. I had a passion even for interviewing. I mean, I took it from asking questions to, ooh, I have a passion from interviewing. I took it from 30,000 feet to 5,000 feet. But actually, even that wasn't specific enough because I realized I didn't actually love interviewing. I loved interviewing people that are good at their job about why they're good. I love anybody who's great at their job, whether it's, I don't know, whether it's a housekeeper or the president or the chief of staff of the army or a sergeant, doesn't really matter. So long as they're brilliant at their job, I love asking them why they're so good at what they do. I'm invigorated by that, passionate about that. But I'm not passionate about interviewing somebody who's good at their job about their political beliefs. I'm not passionate about interviewing someone who's bad at their job to help them get better. Sometimes I wish I were. Sometimes I wish I was passionate about helping someone who was struggling at their job to improve. But, but for no good reason that I can see, I'm not really. I'm only really passionate and invigorated by talking to people that excel, to explore why they excel. I've taken that, that 10,000 foot sky riding of asking questions and having a passion for that, and I've turned it into a specific set of activities that I can build my life around. If you wanna live a strengths-based life, you've got to do the same with your passions. Take them out of the sky and bring them down to earth. I once worked with this guy that just bugged me. I didn't want him to bug me. I wanted to like him, but he just bugged me. Let's call him one-upmanship guy. Because he was that guy who always had to have one thing better than you. If you had an idea, he'd have one better. If you had some client success, his success would be just that much bigger. He was the guy where if you said you'd climb Mount Everest, he said he'd climb to the moon. He was that guy, just always one thing better than you. And I wanted to like him, but, but I would look at him and I would go, I mean, I wouldn't say this out loud, but I would think to myself, you deplete me. You deplete me. Every time I think about going to a meeting with this guy, I would, I would think I'd be walking in like this and I'd find myself just almost physically not wanting to go into the room with him, not wanting to sit across the table with him. What do you do when the people you work with weaken you? Well, here are four strategies you might want to think of. First, stop being around them. I know, sometimes you can't avoid them, but you can probably do something to avoid being around them. And sometimes a legitimate strategy to use for a bad relationship is to get out of it. So can you, first of all, stop being in situations where you're in close proximity with that person? Second, can you team up with someone that softens his rough edges? 
with this chap, with one-upmanship chap, there was a third person who we often used to work around who was really inquisitive. And whenever one-upmanship guy would say, hey, I've just done X, Y, or Z, rather than having my reaction, which was to get all kind of my, get my back up and my bristles up, this person would go, ooh, tell me about that. Oh, tell me more about that. They were just naturally intrigued by what this person had just said. And actually, by hearing one upmanship guy describe his new brilliant idea, I became kind of intrigued by one upmanship guy's brilliant idea. This third person somehow made one upmanship guy feel a little less annoying. Actually, he began to look rather smart to me. Sometimes that works, doesn't it? You bring a third person in, it changes the dynamic. Third, try this. Offer up one of your strengths and see whether or not you can, you can drag him into a place where he ceases to bug you quite as much as he did before. With one upmanship guy, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a guy who's conceptual. I love ideas. So after a while, I would just keep bringing him more ideas and seeing where he would take them. I almost took it as a little competition with myself to keep seeing in every meeting I was with him, could he really one up every new idea, every new initiative, every new thought, every new action I could bring to the meeting. So in a weird way, he was motivating to me to keep offering up my idea strength, my innovation strength, my conceptual strength, and just see what he did with it. And frankly, sometimes he did some pretty darn good ways to take an idea of mine and take it up to a new level. Finally, try shifting your perspective on this person that weakens you. Can you begin to look at them through the lens of their strengths? Every single one of us probably rubs somebody the wrong way. And you could choose to look at somebody through what they don't bring. You could choose to look at somebody through who they aren't. You could choose to characterize anybody in the world by what they don't bring. Well, perhaps the problem wasn't one-upmanship guy's problem. Perhaps it was my problem. Perhaps I was looking at him as someone who was trying to compete with me, and all he was doing was trying, to, was trying to bring new ideas to the table. Perhaps I shouldn't have looked at that as a direct conflict or competition with me. Perhaps, really, I should have looked at that behavior as him never being satisfied. Maybe he was the kind of guy who always was looking for some better way, some new way, some new configuration, some thing as yet unthought of. And therefore, maybe he was an awesome catalyst for me and the rest of the team. I did try that with him, and frankly, it worked like a charm for many years. What began as my problem, he weakened me, I changed my perception, and suddenly I saw him in a totally different light. I'm not, I'm not saying that will work with you every time. To go back to the original S, sometimes you do have to stop being around people. But there are other strategies you can try before you just opt out of the relationship and blame the other person. It's hard to talk about your strengths with your manager, isn't it? Because half the time it sounds like you're boasting. It sounds like you're walking in and bragging that, hey, I'm good at activating projects with clients, or hey, I'm good at analyzing data. Most of us don't really want to seem that kind of self-involved, self-aggrandizing kind of person, so we don't often talk to a manager about our strengths. We talk about our areas of improvement. But you should be talking to your manager about your strengths. You should be volunteering your strengths. And so you need to find a simple way to do that that doesn't make you look like a braggart. Here's the best way to do it. Frame it as, here's a couple of things that I can do, a couple of tangible things that I can do to help us reach our objective. Tie your strength, what, what strengthens you, to the activity and then to the goal that you all have as a team. The more clearly you can make that link, that what you're saying is, how, how can I make a bigger contribution to driving this goal? That's what the manager wants to hear. The manager wants to hear that you've got more to offer, that you've got more to bring. The manager wants to hear where are your shoulders going to be broadest? Where will you be most resilient? Well, you have the answer to that. The manager doesn't. You have the specific answer to that. So if you can frame it as, here are some specific things that I can do to drive this goal, that manager of yours is going to be much more ready to accept it and much more ready to take action on it.